What up, nerds, and welcome to another plant-based episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, slice, dice, and chop up yet another horror movie. My name's Bob. I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode 480, recorded on Monday, June 10th, 2024. Tonight, we're talking about Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978. Before we get into it, let me introduce everyone else on the show. First up, calling in from Washington, D.C., we got your boy, Randeezy. What's up, man? Do you even know who I am? What's going on, buddy? Good to talk to you. Happy to see you again. Everything is normal. Nothing is unusual. Totally. You're clearly the real Randy and not the body snatched Randy. I, I've never been snatched in my life. What are you talking about? Come on. Snatch Come on, you guy. Up, boy. Mm-mm-mm. A little snack. Snack snatch. Good nice. idea. Last but not least, calling in from Seoul, South Korea, we got your boy, Soju. What's up, man? Oh, what up? It's your boy, Caper Stains. Just been nibbling on little pieces of caper today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love that scene so much that in this pretty movie. pretty good. He's like such a... <laughs> The, the amount of swagger that this health yeah. inspector has is out of control. Like, Yeah, he's like a fucking... He's like a... a a homicide detective <laughs> in a seventies fucking procedural. Right straight to the Columbo. He, knew, he knew what was in there. He knew. If it's a caper, eat it. Eat I, it. I think Jay. there's maybe a rat turd in the soup. <laughs> yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm gonna I, go straight a, for it. I think maybe there's a rat turd. Like you gotta go deeper with Donald. <laughs> Donald doesn't My boy Donald high, Duck boy. starring an in invasion of the body snatchers. Oh yes. <laughs> Oh, boys. Uh, Before we get into the main event, let's tackle a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Um, If you guys support us at the $5 level or above, you get the chance to vote on a movie we're talking about this July. We got our July poll posted on our Patreon website. Uh, It's my takeover month. The theme is getting weird with it. And the three oh, movies could that possibly between... mean. I know. <laughs> it's just really normal. It's so cryptic. Very normal. If only, Bob. Tell us about those movies. Well, the three movies are The Greasy Strangler, Nightmare Beach, and The Ice Cream Mang. Well, how are those numbers looking? We're heading to the middle of June. Oof. Uh, sitting at the top of the heap, Nightmare Beach with 44% of the vote. Oh. Second place, Ice Cream Mang, 32% of the vote. Mm. And uh, bring up the real... The rear uh, greasy strangler, twenty four. Bring up the real. Bring Still it on. Though, up. there was a little switcheroo, and those numbers are yeah. pretty close. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, they are pretty close. Still, a lot of people left to vote, and a lot of time to vote. So it's yep. uh, you know, it's not in the bag yet by any any stretch of the imagination. That's bullshit luck. Bullshit luck. Up in there, a lot more competitive than mine and Randy's takeover months this year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Just slam dunks. Yeah. So, well, okay. Well, cool. Yeah. That's what right happens on. when you get weird with it, gentlemen. I guess that's Make what happens when for. people just don't <laughs> really know what to pick. Don't know what the <laughs> fuck. Well, I don't know what any of these choices. are, but the promise is not appealing. <laughs> I have <Blind> choices. <laughs> you do. Uh, in other Patreon news, we're dropping mini casts every other Friday. This past Friday, we just dropped uh, a new one. I was talking about the first Omen, the Omen prequel. Whoa, one of those go backs and revisit some. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta revisit some. You, know, you know how they do. <laughs> yeah. they I do know and... how they do. I like the go backs, but I'm not a big fan of the revisit <laughs> Really? I prefer the revisit I'm not a go backer, oh. you know? Always different, looking different ahead. Stroke you know? <laughs> I'm going to go forward and revisit them. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, Marty McFly. Get your ass on there. <laughs> We're breaking uh, t- time. 
what's <laughs> happening yeah the first omen uh, that just dropped on hulu last week so if okay. you haven't seen it yet you can watch it really easily check out my thoughts on that over on patreon i've been uh, meaning have... to bob how we what have, do you uh... think i think i should check it out uh, you could just listen to my review. Oh. I think okay. honestly. Well, then, like, damn. <laughs> I was, well, you got to join some, the Patreon. First. I had some higher hopes for that. <laughs> it's not terrible, like it, but um, it is like if you just sat down and thought, I wonder yeah. what they would do in an Omen prequel. It okay. is exactly what they do. It is okay. not surprising in the in the least bit. Not a top tier oh, revisit, yeah. some huh? No, but I mean, like, okay. it could oh, it could definitely be worse, though. So. Yeah, we've seen worse. Well, I mean, they, there's no <laughs> bottom to how much worse it could get. You're right. There's You're no right. power bottom. I'm still trying mm, to find no it. power. Where's that bottom? <laughs> Been uh, searching for a bottom for a while. <laughs> get us ISO a bottom power, please. <laughs> Comma power. <laughs> Um. Yeah, that's available on Patreon. Uh, next, next one coming up is going to be on Friday, June twenty first, and it's going to be another another Bob joint. I'm 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 going to be talking about in a violent nature. Mm, uh, great, it's a good one in theaters now, and that's going to be on Shutter sometime later this summer. I mm. don't think they have a exact date yet. So yeah, they need to get out in the summer though. They got to yeah, you know, straight yeah, chilling calendar summer, demands it be released. <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> don't pull any of this late night with the devil ease. bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> or Terrifier Ooh. three. Come on. Yeah, what the hell's going on these days? Christmas in October. That's insane. <laughs> um, in other Patreon news, we got a brand new Patreon supporter. Thank God. We got to give shout mm. outs to uh, a big giant. Thank you to Jordy M for signing up and showing us some love on Patreon. Every dollar you guys contribute goes right back into the show. And as is tradition around these here parts, we owe you the straight chilling salute. This one goes out to Jody. Slap my ass. Mm. Ooh, Thanks very slap much, my Jody. Ass. Appreciate you. So looks as hurting red as it should be. Looks like Daddy Soju's eating this week, boys. <laughs> <laughs> you Man, you're really hanging on by a thread, huh? <laughs> There's a All lot of weeks where you, you just don't eat. Apparently, <laughs> sign up now, Patreon. <laughs> Please, God, <laughs> feed Daddy. <laughs> if you want to feed Diddy Soju. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> we could somehow make this segment any more weird. I don't... Oh, Bob, we can go there. <laughs> I have no uh, doubt that that we have the capability. Uh, you're right. Still looking. The for technology that is here. Still looking for it. <laughs> um, this is the the last bit of Patreon news I have. Uh, and it's a big one. We're gonna be reopening the you pick the flick for the final time this year. Ooh. Yeah, whoa, 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 Bob, that's confused. a big change. Well, so yeah, some people were confused about that. So we do need to be clear. This is the last time you will have an opportunity to make us watch a film in 2024. Yep. So typically we open this up quarterly with five spots per quarter. We're gonna be uh we already did the first two quarters of the year like normal. Uh we're just combining the third and fourth quarter of the year. So there's gonna be 10 picks opening on Sunday, June 23rd, at an undisclosed mm. time of day. Ten spots are going to go to ten different people, and those are going to be the last ten spots for the whole year. Holy gotcha. shit. There you go. The, um, it's Black the only Friday's got to... nothing on this shit. People are about to be get trampled for these things. Get in there. Yeah. it's uh, They typically go fast, so you'll just have to check our Patreon website uh, you know, throughout the course of the day, and if it's open, go and grab you a spot, and um, that's going to be it for this year, and we're going to just kind of slowly work through them throughout the rest of the year, and uh, yeah, it should be interesting. Ten different people. Uh, never, never done it this way before, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, you can't yeah. hoard the spots, just to clarify. Yeah, correct. That's true. You can get uh, one. Yeah, just one per person. Sunday, June 23rd, you pick the flick. All right, get all ready. Right. There you go. And that's all the Patreon news. You guys have plugs? 
Yeah, oh, so, no. uh, <laughs> of course. I haven't found that bottom. <laughs> um, so I um, just to, to mention from last week, but also it's kind of a continuation. So I was on Don't Believe the Hype, the Arctic Monkeys podcast that goes through the entire catalog of the Arctic Monkeys. We were doing the Humbug wrap up that dropped last week. Um, and then this week is the part two of that same episode, just kind of continuing on uh, wrapping up that that album. So, yeah, check that out. Don't believe the hype wherever you get your podcast. Listen to me jaw on about them Damn. monkeys. As often as you reference that podcast, I feel like I'm starting to believe the hype. Believe it. No, no, no you're not to. supposed to do that, Bob. No, I'm fucking up. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, um, that's uh, that's all my cool housekeeping. Uh, last thing I'll mention is uh, we haven't done a Joe Bob watch party in a while because I've just I don't stay in town anymore. Apparently, Hollywood uh, Bob. The next one we should Get be Bob. Yeah, the next one we should be doing is going to be on Friday, June twenty first. So throw that on your calendar, Joe Bob watch party. Cool, nice. There you all go, right, Bob. How clean is your house? Squeaky. All right, let's get into the main event. We're talking Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and we're kicking it off with the back of the box. What's on the back of the box? <laughs> Bob, do you have this box and its porn parody version of Invasion of the Booty Snatchers? Double feature. The Booty Snatchers. Does that exist? Did you search that? Uh, I didn't, but I will. It has to. Right? It it's has too... to exist. <laughs> if it doesn't, I'm disappointed in the universe. Wow, that's. <laughs> if the Bob's witches... on this. If the witches of Breastwick exists, invasion of the booty snatchers definitely. Desperately not seeking screws and probably exists. I gotta think this exists. Uh, I do have this. Um, Era Video put out a really really nice edition of this on 4K recently. I picked that up. Uh, nice. Screen Factory also put this out on Blu-ray, I believe. Super easy to find. It's everywhere. Uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978. Rated PG. This is before the invention of PG-13. I imagine this would be PG-13 uh, if it were to come out today. Runtime of an hour and 55 minutes. Uh, this was directed by Philip Kaufman. Uh, written by W.D. Richter, uh, based on a book by Jack Finney of the same name. Stars Donald Sutherland, Brooke Adams, Jeff Goldblum, Veronica Cartwright, Art Hindle, uh, Leonard. Plot synopsis brought to you by the back of the box is as follows. When health official Elizabeth Driscoll notices that her lover has become strangely distant, this sets in train We've all a been there, hey, boys? Word. <laughs> a series of shocking discoveries that sees both her and colleague Matthew Bennell fleeing for their lives to the sound of ear piercing alien screams. The uh, cosmic ballet goes on. Mm, nice. <laughs> Gentlemen, have you seen this movie before? And would you recommend folks check it out? Ran Deezy, kick us off. Hey there. Hi there. Hi. Uh, yes, I would recommend this. This is. Um... One of those uh, movies that I think we were talking, we've been talking about recently in recent episodes, like remakes, remake ems revisit ems those sorts of things. And uh, this is one of the better ones, in my opinion. I think it's widely considered one of the better ones, um, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, but yeah, this this is just a really, really solid portrayal. It feels uh, it feels authentic, and the performances are great. There's some really fun uh, known actors in this thing uh, to uh, to watch work. Really no reason not to check it out, in my opinion. Right on, Juice. What about you? So this is a flip on my usual script, and I thought for sure I had seen this before. And maybe because there's so many like parodies or like just spoofs on it or something like that. But I don't think I had. There was one scene in particular where I was like, okay, I feel like I've definitely seen this scene before. But uh, like just the whole film, I don't think I actually had this. I think this is my first watch and it was a pleasure. It was one of those times where I was like, 
wow, whoa. My, there's been a couple times on this podcast where I've watched a classic for the first time and been like, man, yeah, this Wicker Mang stands out to me that like held up really well. Um, I think Rosemary's Baby, I think that was my first time watch. But this is one of those. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is great. Whoa, <laughs> this is what it's like to watch a good film again. Um, so I was super excited. So, yeah, I, I would recommend people check it out for sure. And um, it was it was great. But I think first time watch for me, actually. Uh, Bob, I, I didn't answer that you? question myself. Like the, no, yeah. I had seen this before. Bob, you and I watched this for the first time together. I want to say mm, with a nice. with a group, didn't we? Yeah, I, th I think over at the G Twins place. I, I think, think we so. all put this on. Yeah, it was like this, and like it was right near the time we were about to start the podcast. So this was just some time ago. Mm. I want to say, and also like I think Scanners we watched around that same time too. Yeah, because I, I haven't seen say. Scanners either. I don't think. Ooh, but we did do an episode on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't think I was too. part of that group. Like when y'all threw it on, I don't think I was there for that. Yeah, that was like the the sci-fi horror bender that we went on just before we decided, hey, let's mm. record ourselves making dick and fart jokes for three hours and it's ten great, years. Great for plan. ten years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The world has never been the same. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this this was my second second go at this. Um, so mm -hmm. I had seen it before. Definitely do recommend checking it out. I basically echo everything you guys have said. This is a science fiction classic. Yeah. Uh, if you're remotely into science fiction movies, definitely, definitely watch this. Um, it's a cultural touchstone and you've probably heard of pod people, even if you've never seen this movie before. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, that is a hearty recommendation across the board from the straight shilling crew. Um, and to circle back to the invasion of the booty snatchers conversation real quick. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you find a movie? I didn't. I, are you going to talk about the album? I assume. Yeah, I found the album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a um, a 1979 album produced by George Clinton and Ron Dunbar from Parlay Invasion of the Booty Snatchers. Hell yeah, yeah. I did that on wait, wait. vinyl. George Somebody Clinton, sent... like as in Parliament Funkadelic. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, Wikipedia says it's a P Funk spinoff group. Hell oh, yeah! Okay. Good. He's the best. He is the best. This <laughs> the art definitely shows what looks like aliens grabbing giant ass. So. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's... Well, do you, you get that. paid more if they do stuff to your butt? <laughs> you do <laughs> that album. It's got a four <laughs> stars on all music. So out yeah. of how many? Five <laughs> out of five. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, at least something that's, that's exists. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So check that out. It's probably really, really good. Probably. Um, so we are going to be spoiling the shit out of this movie. And here comes your warning. Here it comes. Warning. <laughs> All right, Bob, you got that plop synopsis? I do indeed. All right, plop it on me. Strap in, brace for takeoff. So the movie opens up on an alien planet. We see gelatinous alien life forms fly off into space and land on Earth, taking the form of small pod-like flowers with pink blooms. Elizabeth Driscoll, a scientist at the health department, finds one of the flowers and brings it home. The next morning, her boyfriend, Jeffrey, is acting cold and distant. He takes the garbage out directly to the garbage truck. Elizabeth confides in her colleague, Matthew Bennell, that she thinks Jeffrey is an imposter. He suggests she speak with his somewhat famous psychiatrist friend, Dr. Kibner, um, about this issue she's having. Um, it turns out he is promoting a book at a bookstore, and while they're on the way to meet him, a man running through the streets uh, uh, screaming jumps onto their car. He's chased by an unruly mob. He gets killed uh, by a hit and run, and the mob just looks on very emotionless. They end up meeting Kibner, and he suggests Elizabeth is using the imposter excuse as a way out of her relationship. They also meet Matthew's other friend, Jack Belichick, who is an aspiring writer and also a mud spa owner. He thinks Kibner is full of shit. 
Uh, at the mud spa, Jack's wife Nancy finds an embryonic adult male resembling Jack with no pulse, and it's also not breathing. They call Matthew to investigate, but the body has suddenly disappeared. That's my Matthew... man talk. Matthew goes to warn Elizabeth of what's happened and finds a half-formed duplicate of her in her apartment. Matthew saves Elizabeth and calls the police, but when they arrive, her duplicate has also vanished. Elizabeth studies the flowers and deduces they're somehow the culprit of all this. Matthew tries to contact several government agencies, but slowly realizes they've all been infiltrated by pod people. Matthew, Elizabeth, Jack, and Nancy all lay low at Matthew's apartment and are almost doubled. They wake up, bash their duplicates, and are chased through the streets of San Francisco. Jack tries to create a diversion and runs off screaming. Nancy follows him. Matthew and Elizabeth hide out in the health department office. Kibner and Jack's duplicates ambush them and explain that aliens will fill the earth with serene, emotionless duplicates. Matthew and Elizabeth lock them in the freezer and escape. They run into Nancy, who has survived by hiding her emotions, but she screams when she sees a dog-human hybrid run through the street. They are separated, and Elizabeth and Matthew hide in the back of a truck and are taken over to a pod factory. They're loading up ships uh, at the docks to be taken to other countries, eventually take over the world. They hide out, and Matthew confesses his love for Elizabeth. She disintegrates in his arms. Horrified, he chases after her duplicate and burns down the pod factory. He hides underneath And he makes this sound. (laughs) Hell yeah. (laughs) Which, remarkably, like Bob's laughter. So I think Bob might be a pod person. I'm just not too far off. (laughs) You can't trust me. Uh, he, he hides out underneath the pier while they search for him and proclaim that he can't stay awake forever. Later, we see Matthew working in the health department lab with several duplicates, including Elizabeth. He walks in front of the Capitol building and Nancy approaches him. He points at her and screams the terrifying alien screech we've heard throughout the movie. And then we roll those big, beautiful, silent credits. Yeah, I love a silent credit at the end of a good movie. It's Especially nice. with the ending like this. Whoa. We've had some yeah. good endings lately, boys. Dead and Buried last week was, was amazing. and Yeah. The Strangers <laughs> Good equals one. depressing. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. great when it ended. Fantastic <laughs> oh, man. when it best ended. Credit. My, favorite part, best my favorite part. My favorite part was sprinting out of the theater. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part was seeing those big, beautiful credits uh, roll. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, let's spend but the yeah. rest of the episode talking about the strangers chapter. Let's do it again. <laughs> let's rewind. Let's revisit them. We, we didn't quite know? plumb the depths with that one just yet. Let the hate flow. There's so through. much depth. <laughs> uh, have anyway. you guys seen the yes. original uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers? The '56, I think, is when it came out. I don't think I have. I did it. when no, I was I very, very to. drunk. I haven't either. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious about it. Um, hmm. I wonder if it's like a like a blob situation where it is a, li- a little too old that it feels kind of dated. Like mm. if you didn't see it, it, it back is. in the day, is yeah, it? Kinda, okay, kind of like that. It is. I mean, it's like it it holds up for its era, like like and because of the concept, like it's it it it, it, it broke the mold on its own in its own right. I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know how it's. I'm not 100 percent sure what its reputation is like, but I feel like that like this kind of story around that time period during mm. Cold War stuff, like. This is a fucking story that people were ready to listen to, and yeah. so it hit really, really hard then. But like, yeah, it's a little hokey by today's standards. So this, like, but this is also this is coming out of the seventies, the late seventies, after like you know government uh, trust is, is plummeting or has plummeted quite a bit at this point. And um, yeah, I I think it's I kind why. of a reaction. I don't I don't remember. I want to say <laughs> uh, um, a fog gas or something, a swamp gas. Reflecting mm. over, uh, that's probably what it was. Lake. Venus, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the cool. light reflecting yeah. off of Venus onto some swamp gas. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what it always is. <laughs> yeah, that swamp gas will get you. It's um, out of control. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Time to drain the swamp, boys. Um, got <laughs> <laughs> so, time for another one of these movies, huh? Another well, even this movie, huh? well, even starting off this film, talking about like, um, I, you know famously i think w- would always criticize the beginning of the thing which is another famous remake um you know around this time and stuff um a- about the way they handled their space so when this one kicked off i actually thought the space stuff was i was like hey there's some solid space stuff right there to kick off the one of these kind of like classic remakes and um yeah. 
So from the very beginning, I was um, I was I was on a positive note there. But yeah, these characters, I was just this was just a fun watch. It's so good. It's like so well the very beginning when people start taking over and there's just like weird people in the background of scenes. Yeah. It was so fun to Dude, me. That was the oh, best. it was so cool. Like there's this one who's like peeking through this the yeah, window, that's like window the really in the like door. Clear one, and yeah, it's a clear one. Yeah. yeah then you see them all over the place. Yeah. It's like uh, a hill house sort of deal. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, oh shit. There's people doing shit here. It's so cool. And this character of Matthew is great to follow. You know, Donald Sutherland is fantastic here. He's fantastic. And I thought that him and um, Elizabeth um, had a great chemistry together. I love the yeah. dynamic of them just kind of as friends. And like he's helping her try to figure out like what's going on with her boyfriend and stuff. And like her, him like cooking that meal yeah. and just him doing his whole spell. Like, so the whole opening was just so great to me. It pulled me in immediately. And I was like so excited to take this ride because all the pieces were set up so well there's some something about the way characters were drawn in movies from the 70s it it feels like storytellers weren't rushed the way i th i think they are today they're they're like very very afraid that they're gonna lose the audience's attention but like back in the day there you just get more of a slice of life kind of feel in a lot of these movies before the craziness really starts rolling. So yeah, like the, when they're just like having that little dinner date kind of thing, there, there's like, you can feel the chemistry between them. It's like very oh, tangible. Yeah. And yeah. it's it just like really draws you into the movie and these characters and you truly care about them in a way that I think a lot of, a lot of modern movies just don't, I, th I think they're afraid to take the time to do that, um, but yeah. it pays off it, in this movie. It's interesting that like the way it's the the way the dialogue is delivered that I think makes the biggest difference to me with like a movie like this. And it's not all '70s stuff because, I mean, like you watch like an episode of The Love Boat and it's like the most hollow shit you've ever seen in your life. But there's kind of a reversal between mm -hmm. film and TV now because prestige totally. TV is so mm -hmm. big and so yeah. so funded. And so sought after by big, big names and things like that, that, you know, the big films are kind of suffering the loss of that a little bit, especially because theaters are not, you know, producing the box office receipts or they're or like a lot of the stuff. It's just a completely different paradigm now. So I feel like those things have blended so much that, yeah, they're they're doing more to keep you interested because not because people's attention spans are necessarily less, but because they're not necessarily sitting in a big room where there's one giant screen in front of them to watch. They are sitting in their home folding laundry and checking their phone while they're watching things. So people know that. And when they make yeah. shit, it has a whole different like set of parameters it needs to hit in order to maintain that focus. So, yeah. But like anyway, back to the dialogue, they're like. The way that they, sorry, tangents of galore, but the the dialogue in this, it just feels so lived in and so like truthful. Um, and like uh, it has this sort of like almost what is what is that called? Uh, mumblecore. It's got kind of a mumblecore feel where it almost feels like a little improvised, even though it doesn't quite feel improvised. It just feels very authentic and very conversational. Um, in ways that you know, that a lot of movies just don't really nail. Like a lot of good movies don't necessarily nail. A lot of times it's either too haughty and too like up there to be like super, super believable. So you have to bolster it with other things or it's like just completely hollow and just being propped up by like, like whatever spectacle. This doesn't have that problem. Every part of this movie from like the spectacle is just the right amount. The authenticity of the characters and the way they interact is just the right amount. And they also we have a lot of smart characters in this movie, which makes it easier to connect with them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got the supporting characters being played by fucking Leonard Nimoy and Jeff Goldblum. So you I didn't know just, Jeff Goldblum yeah. was in this movie when he probably was yeah. such a delight for I, love, I forgot like, not yeah. knowing. Yeah, the star Sutherland power. The only character this. I remember from this, and it's like, yeah, there's a ton of star power in this. Go ahead, Bob. I'm sorry. The the it, the charisma is just sort of like dripping off the screen with these characters. There's so much. There's so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. I love the that he just owns a, like a mud spa and like there's major scenes that take place in there. Like what a what a thing from the past. I like I don't know that that happens anymore. The dude in there who like 
is getting his belly rubbed down and like his booty slapped on and it's like what is that's what's going on there what's uh that's I mean, just I'm... 70s new york baby yeah <laughs> not york, san francisco whatever um mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, yeah yeah when jeff goldblum showed up i was like so pleased but also yeah just watching everybody it's it, it's got this weird dynamic from the story point too where so you watch the opening scene, you know what's going on. Like, so there's not this necessarily like mystery. You have this information that the main characters don't have, but there's still this aspect of there is this kind of mystery of who are the pod people and then also to kind of what's going on. So I love the scene that eventually pays off really well that that just kind of keeps going on throughout the movie of Jeffrey first like taking out the trash and then yeah. throughout the movie we yeah. just see this trash and trash and you really even though like you know you know before everybody else how these pod people are these um these you know aliens these plants they're taking over or whatever but like you don't know what's going on and so it oh it's this great balance to where when she disintegrates at the end Mm -hmm. oh my god dude like oh i love watching a good movie i was like so giddy i was so excited because that's amazing that (laughs) exactly that's how i was feeling last night um that Uh, paid off yeah (laughs) i mean yeah yeah. Yeah. (laughs) it paid off so well though where the whole time you're seeing people take out the trash take out the trash but you never really see and they give you a little bit more each time oh like you get a body and then you see the birth of these things coming out of the plants or whatever but you never really see they hold on to that perfectly well and deliver it at the end to have this impact Oh, beautiful. Just perfect setup. Perfect in, fucking setup. In that sequence, when her body sort of disintegrates and the pod version of Elizabeth pops up like naked, the first the mm. first thing that came to mind was like, oh, I wonder if our boy Matt Stinson would fuck a pod person. Like that's, oh, yeah. that, that's of course, the first thing that comes to <laughs> everyone. First mind. thing that comes to yes. mind. It so uh, if, oh, yeah. if if you're listening, Matt, call in and let us know. <laughs> let, us, know. let us know if you'd fuck oh. this pod person. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like it, it it's just it, you're 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 dead on that. It's like it, it hits really strongly in that scene, and like the, I don't know. Like I, I loved watching it this second time. Or I get maybe maybe even my third time, but I was looking at like how the effects were done in particular because like, kind of side side tangent. When I was working at a summer camp, I had was a videographer at a summer camp and a ph- photographer, and I helped with some activity where the kids created like pods um, out of paper mache or whatever, and we filmed it in black and white and sh- had like a little movie premiere or whatever. Where mm. it was just this nifty little effect we did with paper mache and like gloves and shit like that, and it was like it looked kind of good. It looked kind of like you know a really cheap, really impra- in, in, like infantile version of what they do in this movie. But when she starts disintegrating, I loved looking at how they did that because they had had that done by like putting like, I don't know what it was, but like uh, some kind of like uh, hot glue or something on their face or like Elmer's glue or something to make her, let them look flaky and peely or whatever. And then mm-hmm. they also had like some sort of like wire or, or, or ch- uh, uh, what is it? Fishing line or something like just sort of like pull in like, like fuck up her <laughs> with her cheeks and then they cut away for a second cut back and there's the dummy and it falls apart mm-hmm. like it was just a really fucking simple and cheap and effective thing that i didn't like i never clocked it before i was looking intensely for those sort of things this time so like i don't know it's just great great practical effects work is i guess the net of it yeah yeah all the practical effects look solid in this uh the the pods themselves not they look great um that even so the human face dog thing i completely forgot about <laughs> and when it runs out dude it's jarring um, I, human monster. I read something about how they achieved that and they just like cut a face out of paper and like ha- put it on the dog and like that was, was it, it paper i or I maybe, maybe it was like silicone or, or something i don't know oh, man. but yeah, that was it. It was like nothing, nothing crazy, and it was very effective. I don't know. It, fu- it freaked me out. It's, uh, I don't know. That's probably my favorite effect in the whole movie, though. Um, 
that and the it's aliens like favorite. at the very beginning. Yeah, like you mentioned, Juice, the very beginning sets it up perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, even the I love goop, that it's the it, guy it and his fun... dog too. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I was the goop in the rain. It was uh, such a simple thing. Um, but like the goop and then it's seeing it like spread out. It's like, man, this is from the very beginning. It's like, this is looking good. Mm-hmm. You know, we already had the space scene. Uh, but yeah, the effects, the effects look great in this. And, and they're all like distinctly unique, but have this, like, they make sense for, you know, what's going on. I love when they first find, that body in the mud spa and then and they keep they keep building it that's what's so great what i was talking mm-hmm. about before with the trash thing where it like eventually mm-hmm. pays off you know they slowly build it. you find this body the hair kind of reaches out the white hair then later you actually see them birth and then there's a bunch of them the scene that i the one scene which is a weird random scene where i was like i feel like i'd seen this before was when matthew shows back up to elizabeth's house after he's taken her away Mm -hmm. and he shows up with the police and there's this like fake body in the closet that's really just dirt and yeah like a shape or whatever something about that was like so distinct to me um but but anyway like even just the bell so yeah the effects look good and and they like set it up and even going off the effects but the fucking sound and the shape of the mouths you know you don't really have to it's not it's not a ouija where you gotta fuck it up with cgi but just paired with the sound oh it looks so dis. it's so distinctly Mm -hmm. disturbing yeah i was thinking about the movie um at world's end watching it this time around because they i mean obviously and that's what it's well major known that they influence yeah. Yeah. made a major influence but like the the way that they scream in that movie and they do use effects in that but it's not like you said like it's not like the, the little liquify tool in photoshop spreading their <laughs> mouths a little too wide that can yeah. work in different spots but it's very rarely done in a way that in my opinion that, that looks convincing and it's much it's much better to have these people that are supposed to be perfect mimics be absolutely visually perfect but then have this ungodly unholy sound that they spew out it's great yeah it's, a, it's it just like a so simple good. effective thing the uh the sound designer uh, is a dude named ben burt uh, who apparently also helped create a lot of the signature sound effects used on star wars uh but he when whenever he was designing the scream of the alien in this it was like you know obviously layered with a bunch of stuff but i think the most distinctive sound that's worked in there is a a pig squeal Mm. yeah i could see that yeah really really effective um also throughout the course of the movie they they've they worked in a lot of like bird sounds and like you know stuff of nature and then the longer uh you get through the movie uh, that stuff sort of fades away and it's overtaken by the sounds of the like dump trucks uh, mm-hmm. running and crushing all the remains of the humans and it's just more mechanical uh, which is I didn't notice that but that's that's nice to, yeah, it's attention like a, to detail for sure subconscious kind of yeah kind of unnerving thing I could see them I doing did... that with like less justification narratively even just because like you know you're moving down this narrative pipeline you don't want to have birds chirping and singing songs in your final yeah. scene necessarily well, I would say I didn't notice that consciously, but now that you say it, I mean, it definitely there is this way that this dread is built up. You do have that one scene where he's going around and like trying to call different agencies and he's, you know, kind of losing his grasp on um, reality or trust or whatever. But I mean, there is this this ominous existence and it, it probably comes through stuff like that with the sound design but and also just like the the people moving through the streets this movie is so fucking good because it, it's not having to do, it's it's being clever now there's some amazing effects that we already mentioned so it does also look good but i mean just like the scene of the people's legs walking like in unison where it's the shot you can't see anybody's i don't it's like uh two-thirds to the movie or whatever but or maybe later I, it's showing everybody's legs Is it when I they're think in it's, line for the pods or no i think it's when matthew and elizabeth are trying to like 
fit in with society or something um or they're yeah. walking they're walking through the street okay. but all the legs are moving like in unison oh yes i remember where they like turn and see them and they kind of yeah all just yeah 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 slowly yeah, start yeah. gaining speed exactly and they're like looking over their shoulders and stuff yeah oh man stuff, and yeah. yeah just people walking and like people congregating in the streets but they move in a certain way or they're grouped in a certain way and it's that's all it is though and then you take out some sound you know you take out some natural mm -hmm. sound oh there's not birds chirping anymore this doesn't feel like the regular world that you've been in but it's subconscious you're not picking up on that because you're worried about like what's gonna happen to these people it, oh it's so it's so fun it's so good i mean this is one of those movies that i really feel like could be would be hurt if it added more soundtrack because the silence in this movie is fucking crushing like it, it, it's like dreadful and like in a positive way it adds to the dread and you know this movie like you were saying like we like they don't know what's going on but we do and that reminded me very much of like the hitchcock bomb analogy which for those uh, I, this is like extremely famous and i'm not blowing a whole lot of people's minds with this but uh, it's this analogy that hitchcock had and i'm going to try and read it off of this <laughs> this post that i found on my first blow my Google mind randy rain. it was uh Four people are sitting around a table and talking baseball, or whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off and blows people to smithereens. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience that there's a bomb under the table, and that it'll go off in five minutes. Now the whole emotion the audience is, of, is totally, of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information. Now the conversation about baseball becomes suddenly very vital because they're saying it to you. Because they're saying to you, don't be ridiculous. Stop th talking about baseball. There's a bomb under there. You've got the audience working. So that's what this that's mm. how this one relays that story. And it's a screenwriting mm. thing. But like that this that's this whole movie, right? Like that's what the, the strength of this whole movie is. There's this just crushing feeling of dread all the time because they're always two, three, four steps behind the curve, and we know it the whole yeah. time. Because not just police. because of the name yeah. of the movie, but because this movie is a remake. It's like an exceptional use of a, a very basic premise to remake. That's the same mm -hmm. sort of thing as the thing where it's mm -hmm. like we know that there's a danger that somebody might be a thing uh, or like somebody might be taken over or replicated or whatever. We have that. Uh, we know that from the dog. We know that from like being able to gather that pretty quickly. But the characters don't really figure that out right away. So it's like, I don't know. It's just it's just very good. Um, suspense writing and that's what keeps this movie going is the suspense of like how the fuck are they going to surmount this there's a whole line of people from all over the goddamn state or country or whatever gathering pods and taking them back home to overtake their friends and family like this this is like it's the government it's everybody like everybody has been obfuscating this since the beginning we don't even know when Leonard Nimoy transitioned like we don't know like mm -hmm. We don't see, we're not privy to most of that. And that's what makes the final shot work so goddamn well, where we see mm. Donald Southern, Sutherland and we're just like, is he, isn't he? He seems fine. Yeah. Is he? And then what's her name comes up, Kate or whoever it comes up and he, he d lets out the shriek. And it just, it's just a, a confirmation of, of all of the dread that we felt the whole fucking movie. It's just great. It's, it's just a great. classic ending. Like it's it's one it's probably one of the best endings in horror or science fiction that you you could conjure up. And this this movie really is like a it's an interesting it'd be kind of a perfect double bill with the thing and I'm sure people have done that already. But it is sort of like a very um understated um simpler version of what John Carpenter was able to do with his remake of the thing. Like the mm -hmm. when you think of the thing it's like it's bright colors and that crazy score that's uh, like half uh, Ennio Morricone, half John Carpenter. And then like the thing itself is like, mm -hmm. you know, the pinnacle of, of 80s practical effects and like everything here is achieving just as much, but it's like very restrained and like, I don't know, mm -hmm. and it's just more subtle, but I think they both work in such a great way. That'd be a baller double feature for sure. I would I mean, it's just it. like, the insidiousness of subtle subterfuge, like in a time where yeah. people are afraid of their governments and afraid of, um, you know, like not not even it's not just the government, but like that's a huge component of this, right? Like that's clearly the central thing I get from this is that this is warning you against groupthink and just accepting the narrative and all that sort of thing. It's what led to the question everything bumper stickers that eventually led to more caustic shit. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like this is. 
it's a it's just it's just very compelling shit. And I also thought about like um that uh Twilight Zone episode, the um the famous one. Uh they're they come they're coming to Elm Street or some shit like that. Like what is it? Mm, they, I don't know. They, it's like the one where like everybody's thinks that their neighbor is uh been compromised by uh by an a, a outside alien force or uh. something, or like everybody like they're turning on each other, and it's all a big uh parallel to to the red scare basically yeah um and then the uh, you zoom out at the end of the episode and whatever extraterrestrial or whatever saying like see all we had to do was do one simple thing and they turned on each other so this is it's what's interesting is that that's a really great story that's kind of telling a similar thing but it's done in a completely different way where you where the uh people in the movie know already with you that something is amiss but they don't know what and it's their yeah. paranoia that makes drives them insane and like tears them apart it's so interesting because they're making similar points but they're like the the baddies as they were are achieving their goals through entirely different means and it leads to an entirely different strain of events to compel us as an audience i just thought that was really fucking interesting to think about is it is it called the monsters are due on maple street is that the one you're that's looking the for? one yes yeah the monsters are due on. i don't remember what the inciting incident is but like all, like all, the power goes out or something and or mm-hmm. like something very strange happens something stranger than that i want to say and then they just are like that. Well, Jeff, he he he's been messing with the power line or whatever it is. It's been it's been years. But it's also building in there. I mean, it's it's interesting to go back and look at, you know, we see all these like kind of popular films. And it another thing it reminded me of specifically too, because the time was um the film I did earlier this year, The Conversation, which was 1974, which is mm-hmm. all of, it's uh, very much about paranoia, uncertainty. You're not sure if someone's following you, if somebody's watching you. And just this like these scenes that have you set up, it's they're set up well back to back because you're never you never feel safe no matter what situation you're in so you go to as the audience like knowing what's going on you go to the bookstore and it's so full of people and there's you and she is already elizabeth is already starting to notice some people acting weird and so you're like get the fuck out of there because there's people all surrounded you. It's easy for them to grab you or whatever, you know, but then the very next scene is when they go to the mud bath. And then that's where you have this you know, isolated paranoia where there's this body over there or, or whatever. And so even the idea of like, you got to sleep sometime, there's no safety. Yeah. You call the police. There's nobody to call. You try to go in isolation and there's nobody. And even the one lady who s- survives at the end, it's just another build, 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 amazing payoff. Like everything else that like we've been mentioning in this of no matter what, you know, they try to go to their lab. They, you know, they're in their house. They're in this bookstore around a lot of people. They're driving through the street or whatever. It's like you're never safe. And even this lady who somehow managed to just go along this whole time and gets, you know, caught in the end. Um, oh, it's just it's it's mm-hmm. so scary. Paranoia. It's it builds paranoia so well there's no moment where even you as an audience who knows what's going on because there's no key there's no there's no, there's no obvious way to change yeah so there's no way to change. beat it yeah, yeah. it's so, so fast yeah. that's the thing that's like so like like oppressive about it to me is like it th- this movie is very quiet and you know that things are moving at a goddamn fever pitch pace this whole movie i think t- takes place over the course of like a couple days you yeah, know what like I mean? two like, or th- maybe three days. It's yeah. very quick. It's like one night that, uh, whatever. Like, uh, well, you uh, had the first night where Dinklage Jeffrey like gets taken fucker. over. Jeffrey, yeah, yeah. like he Peter gets taken Dinklage over. That takes one <laughs> night, and like he he looks exactly like Peter Dinklage. He really does. I mean, <laughs> um, but like it just it, everything is just happening so quickly that like. N- even if they knew exactly what was going on from the from the jump, there's like yeah. nothing they can do. Those flowers are fucking everywhere. The whole movie is yeah. an exercise in fe- the feudal resistance. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so even you as an audience who are there's like frustrating moments where you're like, I mean, I I even felt this where I was like, 
stop calling the police, you know, yeah. or even then, I think maybe one of the most like frustrating as a viewer viewing this, not necessarily in the way the movie's crafted, but just like participating along was when after they've done all this and they like get in the taxi and it's like, motherfucker, you, you can't get in a taxi or whatever. Um, <laughs> I love that the taxi driver is like, oh, we got a we got a type H. A type H. Type H. H. Yeah. Very subtle guy. Right. <laughs> Human. Yeah. But it's just I don't know. It's just there is no obvious answer. And as you keep going along, you realize that like nowhere is safe. There's really nothing that you could do. So in the way that we like to play those games as viewers of like, could I survive this saw trap? Could I get away from this killer? Could I do this? It's like you're watching it, but also you feel that just like helplessness a little bit yeah. of like yeah you gotta fucking sleep <laughs> like what are you gonna do mm -hmm. like you know so yeah it's um but it builds it it doesn't give that to you right away you know there are these moments of frustration or this like oh try this do this oh that doesn't work oh we're fucked aren't we yep we're fucked <laughs> like it's just yeah. this it's just such feels a like good a, ride it just feels like a like it feels like the bar for this kind of paranoia movie to me. Like, and yeah. there's so many movies that feature this thing. Like, we were you dead and buried last week, which isn't this kind of yeah. isn't this movie, but it features the same idea of people being either coerced or brainwashed or whatever, and Can't not trust knowing the people who to around trust. You. Yeah. Right, like your your lead characters, as you as the audience experience it, you don't know who to trust. And then uh, on the other extreme of that is like zombie movies where you know, like, you know exactly who's a zombie for the most part, but you can't trust the people around you to take care of each other. So, like, yeah. there's just so, like, I love how many, like, thinking about this in terms of the broader spectrum of film and storytelling in the last, like, whatever many years, because it all seems like this paranoia can be come at from so, so many different angles. It's like a prism. There's know. there is something else on the on the back of the box here that I, I skipped over, mm -hmm. but I wanted to re read it real quick and see if, uh, if you guys really leaned into this when you were watching it, this idea. Uh, so it says, uh, transposing the action to the heart of San Francisco allows Kaufman to retain all the suspense of Jack Finney's original story while adding caustic social commentary about the selfishness of the 1970s, quote, me generation that remains all too relevant today. The me generation is something I don't think I had ever heard of before are you guys oh, familiar buddy. with that yes. <laughs> that sounds like a yes okay oh, yes buddy. but like in the sense that that is like a moniker that's been given to just about every generation every generation since the yeah. dawn of fucking selfish time. little shits like yeah, literally just, millennials yeah. were given that gen z like it's the me 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 gener like time magazine uh. has done like four different covers on this uh, separated by like 15 years each or some shit oh, like boy. it's crazy <laughs> we are the so, yeah i mean generation well, I mean, yeah. the the one, so you just reading that, the first thing that popped up in my mind was the scene of the guy um, jumping on the car and then running off and getting mm -hmm. hit by a car and the whole kind of lifeless society gathering, gathering around to like watch him or to look at him. I, mm -hmm. That was kind of like the most potent um, moment maybe of that kind of social commentary, especially within... Um, I, I don't know for some reason this popped up in my mind, um, in my mind, there's a lot of, uh, 30 rock jokes about like living in New York and like how cold people are, or how you're just like, nobody <laughs> even like sees you as like a human anymore, just because it's so busy. And like, there's, you know, people just pass you by without even looking at you or even giving you any kind of like thought or consideration or anything like that. And like, I mean, yeah, I mean that, so that scene specifically, kind of sticks out in my mind but yeah. it's not something that was like living with me as i was experiencing this film yeah and yeah like, it, honestly like sorry go ahead bob it 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 sort of jumped out at me a little bit in leonard nimoy's sort of um th the way he describes elizabeth's relationship and how she's using this idea of uh, an imposter as a way to abdicate responsibility uh from her relationship like she uh she doesn't want the responsibility so she's fabricating a way to get out of the responsibility which that that seems really interesting to me 
and may another way you could kind of take it i think is if you are watching this movie perhaps the aliens are able to take over so easily because people are not paying attention to things around them they're very hyper focused on their own little microcosm of you know their their own lives what's happening immediately around them so um which i think you could absolutely uh say that about again every generation but yeah some yeah. of that just just kind of made me think about this movie so, slightly differently um what, think, what what did you get randy yeah i mean i think that's true i don't, I don't remember what i was originally gonna say but like to that point like it, it's true I, I think the me generation thing i don't even think it's a generational thing i think it's a humanity thing like having an in, in, individual needs and and focuses like that's not something necessarily that is bad that is just something that is a quirk of humanity like we we there are differences like justin you've talked about how in korea there's like more of a focus on community and doing things for the good for for the the good the of the greater community good. Like that. the greater oh. good but in like in in america like rugged individualism is a thing and is like has its own has a, co- a cost a cost a causticness to it um I don't know, like just seeing how that stuff plays out in different like eras and things like that. I don't think that it's all that different. In the words of one of my favorite uh, uh, YouTubers slash journalists, um, I think people have been dumb assholes since the dawn of time. And I think <laughs> where this mo- that this movie is resonant now because that's true. Because yeah. like if there is a critique being made about people's individual focus on themselves or whatever – and maybe maybe it is if this movie is like criticizing the idea of like talking to a therapist about your problems or about how way you perceive things like i don't necessarily buy into that on a whole level like i i think that like an uh, uh what is it an, not un, not interrogated but like an unexamined life ain't worth living that's the phrase right i think i brought this up a week or two ago like that's that's true you have to examine yourself or else you're repressing your shit and you're like going to have fucking problems for the rest of your life if you're not confronting yourself your problems things like that so i don't necessarily see that but this movie is making a bigger point that like you can be led astray by people who think they know better than you do what's happening in front of your very eyes so there's like a little bit of push and pull balance on that for me internally as as just a thinking philosophically about it but this movie is very like no you should trust yourself which is also valuable I don't know. Well, it kind of well to me, one of the things that stuck out specifically about that character and kind of how like how frustrating he was, it felt like a little bit more fleshed out version of that lady from the birds who's in the diner, who's like, I know all about birds and no birds wouldn't do that, where it's the supposed to be the logical, practical mind who's supposed to evaluate this and give you maybe some kind of answer or to give you some kind of hope of, yeah, of hope of defeating it or some kind of key to unlocking, you know, what you should do next, but they're just as lost as you are or whatever they you know they're they're just as incapable of dealing it with it as you so to me i kind of added this feeling of the kind of the hopelessness of like nobody mm-hmm. nobody can deal with this nobody right. can well know. i mean and he that, that's the thing is like nimoy is making sense like he makes he, like he's like well what do you, do you want me to believe that your husband has been taken yeah, over by like, an alien presence because i can't believe that you have yeah. to under, like i would react that way too I would you have these are there are things that are unprecedented that you have to be confronted with in order to to believe that's just a basic truth yeah. that that is why like this movie is the question everything movie it is like that's that is its core thesis in my mind is like don't trust authoritarians do trust yourself like that's what this movie ultimately says to me and like if they had trusted themselves from the beginning, maybe they could have like gotten the fuck out of Dodge quicker, but like there's a lot to learn. And I don't even think that was even possible, but they would have maybe stood a better chance. It, it just yeah. seems like that's, that's like sort of just the central central thesis. If I were to, if I was yeah. to put a fine point on it, got to sleep sometime, you know, mm-hmm. uh, any other major points you guys want to hit on before we rate this thing? I'm good. No. Nada. All right, let's do it out of five. Juice, how do you feel about Invasion of the Body Snatchers? This was a delight to watch. I was absolutely giddy. And I still, I'm glad that I still like get these opportunities. Um, Every now and then this, you know, classic pops up that 
never seen before and it lives up to the hype and you know like i'd mentioned before it's happened a few times on this cast and this is one of them um i was just so giddy watching this i was so impressed from the very beginning that like i said the space scene the goop coming down it just all looked good and then and then you're right there with the characters and it's it's easy to fall along with them they have good chemistry the acting is really good the dialogue is set up really good there is this even though it's like pretty grounded and feels lived in there also is this element of um you know fantastical nature of this character like we said the guy going in and just like knowing everything about this restaurant and being exceptionally good at his job to, to, you know, a fictional degree. Um, but like, it's, it's fun to watch. It makes it entertaining. So um, I loved uh, their interactions together. Elizabeth and Matthew were really good. Um, I love the surprise of, you know, Jeff Goldblum showing up and, of course, he's got amazing charisma. I kind of like, if anything, just wish there was more of him. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then I, the ending too. I didn't know that was going to be the ending, and it was so great. Like, wow, what a rare experience to just like go into like something like this and just experience it. But it was so fun to me. It, that ending was like uh, fantastic. Um, Elizabeth melting away into dust and oh man it's all so good the the pods being birthed and they look so fucked up and then all the the dump trucks and everything yeah uh, it's it's great it was, even if I was gonna like critique it on something I was thinking like even if somehow I dropped this down to a 4.5 it'd still get bumped back up because you get half star for the abo so I might as well not even <laughs> like try Right, so. don't even play yeah don't so play. this is definitely gonna be a five-star film no matter wh what way you swing it because there's definitely no justification for ever even dropping below 4.5 so it's gonna be a five star for me bob i really enjoyed watching this it lived up to the hype a lot of fun and whew, it was a good week good week for movie watching bob out of five how do you feel about invasion of the booty snatchers 1979 album <laughs> I I mean I feel about the same as you do man. The first time I put this record on I was just oh, transported yeah. to another place, brother. A uh, place <laughs> full no, this... of booty. <laughs> I was snatching it. Uh, this movie's great, like top to bottom. It's it's really fantastic. All the performances are just like dialed in so well. It's written incredibly well. You can feel the tension from moment to moment just sort of ratchet up in a way that it feels it feels like you're in the the hands of a filmmaker that like knows exactly the movie he's making and and like at every turn you're sort of pleasantly surprised i love all the practical effects the sound design in this is like top notch i also another thing like watching movies from like the 70s it's something they feel like so natural like the way they're lit it, like when you watch movies today, they're like blue or gray or green or orange. Or like, this just looks like a city. Like, you know, yeah. I don't know, just like simple little things like that where you just feel like you're in a real place with real people experiencing like real fear and terror. It just feels so grounded, even though the movie's about aliens that are plants that are making copies of people. And like, I don't know, I just, I really love the grounded feeling of this movie. Um, I love the concept of an alien that is a flower, how cool that is, and that they're going to make copies of you that come out of these fucking pods, and that potentially they're going to get some sort of like cross DNA fuck up and make a dog with a human face. <laughs> like all of that shit is insane. Like if there was a, somehow a sequel to this, which, you know, obviously there wasn't one made, but like, would we see like more fucked up like alien hybrid creatures or something like that? My, my mind just kind of ran with that idea. Um, the scream is amazing. The the ending of this movie is such an iconic ending. I'm I, I'm kind of blown away that it wasn't spoiled for you, Juice. Um, the uh, it was it was a meme for a while. People would use that oh. image of him pointing yeah. and screaming for like, everything. Um, I love this sort of neo noir kind of vibe of them, you know, going around uh, the city trying trying to figure out what's going on, trying to crack it. Um, the, the little moments where, uh, Matthew's calling the police for like the fourth time 
and he doesn't give him his name, but they use his name. It's like such a simple That's but cool, yeah. chilling moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't. If I had a critique, I would say maybe the cat and mouse feels a little bit long towards the third act. Maybe they could have sped it up a touch, but that's a, that's it. I mean, that's, and that's nitpicky, honestly. Um, and I think we're, I think we could go a lot longer on this. I feel, I feel like we're just scratching the surface of it. Um, this is definitely a movie that you could watch time and time again. And I think really pull a lot out of, so it's, it's, it's thick, it's layered, it's grounded. It's, it feels, it feels awesome, man. Um, I, so five stars, what else? What else could I say? Five stars. I think it's Bobby. layered. It feels awesome. Fox feels awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. Snatch that booty. Uh, Randy, how do you feel? Uh, yeah. So I more or less agree with everything you guys say, uh, have said about this. Like, Disagree with me. There, I dare you. It, there's something that like about watching this for a second or third time, like I still get stuff out of this. There's still plenty to talk about, but I don't, I just feel like a subsequent watch as, as much as you can pull out of it, it doesn't pack the same punch. So I didn't have the same, I didn't have a giddy experience this time like Justin did, but I remember f- being like blown away the first time I saw this. Cause I, I, I don't know, like you, as somebody from our generation, you just kind of think, of 70s stuff as like i don't know like just much schlockier than this uh it's just what i was anticipating especially some invasion of the body snatchers i don't uh, it was a remake of the 50s or whatever so like that's where the title came from but i didn't really understand that like there's two ways that movies like this can be remade they can either be lean into the hokiness or they can lean into this like sincerity of it and this one leans into the sincerity and it pays off big time uh, but like my rewatches of like I wouldn't say they've suffered, but they've they've not reached the same heights. I don't know if that's even a fault, really. It's just I'm trying to think critically about this movie, and that comes to mind. Um, but I like so much about this. It's uh, the the way that the silence is used, um, just the knowledge that they're fucked throughout. Like that, I guess that's part of what's missing. Is like missing, missing. That's part of what's missing here. Is like like on a second watch. Is like I know how fucked they are. And so, like, maybe some of those tensions are dialed back for that reason. Um, I don't think I'm going to ding it too much for that. But I don't know. Like, I, I have questions about the nuts and bolts of this. Like, how much information do these people retain uh, memory-wise? Like, like they say, that's it, painless, and you wake up, and you're just your same self. But if, I don't know, is that true? Because wouldn't the last person who spoke to you if they get transitioned just know what your plan is at that point like i was thinking to myself if i if this movie was remade today and they wanted to do an inversion of the ending they could have what's your name come up to the guy and say like oh my god you're still alive are you all right or whatever and the guy'd be like holy shit you you're still alive i can't believe it this is insane what are we going to do and then she screams at him because she was able to get mm. under get under his defenses by just knowing him before she transitioned yeah. Like, I think there's some interesting stuff that can be done with remakes to this, but like, this is one of those movies that's like such a perfect remake. It's like the thing, it's like the blob. It's a really tough act to follow. <laughs> they kind of perfected the formula, and I know they did a 90s version that is not widely liked, but I haven't seen it. It's not um, bad, but it's not this. Yeah. Right. That's that's the general temperature I get from, from people's reaction to that. I do like, Rob, you mentioned like a neo noir feel to this, and I totally get that. And like, if, it feels Cronenberg-y in that way to me. Or when you said that, I was like, yeah, it kind of has like a weird, not so dramatic crimes of the future sort of thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not so body horror either, but like, yeah. And the effects, <laughs> man, it's just like yeah, very simple chairs. effects. <laughs> yeah. No crazy bone chairs and shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I really like this movie and I'm, I am, I'm trying my hardest to be critical for it but I just really like it. I think that it's, it's everything you guys said was right. All that stuff is good. So I think I'm going to give it a five. I think I'm going to five. I was on the fence. I, like, I feel like there's something in me that feels like there's something uh, that you could, uh, you could critique about this movie and it would be a fair ding. And maybe that's part of why I wasn't feeling it as much this time, but I can't put my finger on it. So I'm just going to give it a five and room for room for uh further analysis later room to regress. Yeah. <laughs>
Cool. Well, I mean, yeah, simple math. That's going to be a five from oh. the straight chilling crew. It stinks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's jump over into our Rotten Tomatoes segment and see what the critics and users have to say. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Rotten Tomatoes segment in which I'm going to have these two gents guess within the best of their abilities what the aggregate positive score is on RottenTomatoes.com from both critics and users. Invasion of the Body Snatcher 78 has 69 critical reviews. 69. 69 whoa. reviews. There's 69 of those. Thank God. Oh, um, whoa. There's 69 dudes that have weighed in here. <laughs> 69 dudes! And uh, we're going to start with Bob today, I think. Bob, out of those 69 dudes, what percentage would you say gave this a positive review? Critics, remember. I think this is a bit of a critical darling. Um, I think it's going to be very high. Just how high is the question? Um, I question every day. Ooh, God. How high? 92. 92. All right. Year of Our Lord, 1992 from Bob. Soju, you you following up? You going high? You going low? I got to go with the straight chilling spesh of 96 dudes. 96 dudes. <laughs> Ass you never have enough head. dudes. <laughs> I like to rest my head upon an ass. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, also it. simple. Also simple math here. This is just a hair away from a perfect guess from one of you. And that one of you, the person who guessed the closest, is Bob, Bob got this one just one percentage point off. It's a 93%. 93%. Ah, That's a hell skeet. (laughs) It's a hell something, I'm told. (laughs) Um, I'm told. (laughs) uh, I'm going to jump over to the uh, audience, and then we'll do the critics' consensus. So the audience score has a hefty sum a tidy sum of 25,000 plus ratings in here. Whoa. So pretty good size. Um, start with juice this time. Out of those 25,000 ratings, what would you wager is the aggregate positive score? It's still got to be super high, but just on sheer volume, I'll drop it a little bit lower because there's always people throwing some crazy negative opinions out there. Sometimes <laughs> about movies, sometimes about podcasts. Um, I'm going to give... <laughs> Uh, I'll say 89. 89 percentile. All right, Bob, what about you? Yeah, I think the sheer number is going to drive it down a touch, but still high overall. People love this movie. So I'm going to take the over. Uh, I'll take a 91. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a 90, we can tie. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bob, what's so funny? Well, there will be... <laughs> There will, there will be no tie, I'm sad to say. Um, one of you is certainly closer than the other. Um, and that person is going to be Soju. We got a split today. Dude, we, how many skeets are we getting? I don't know. It's we're been like on a, a month, str- right? We're on a streak of skeets. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if we were going to keep it going. Holy shit. You're going to keep it going. You're going to keep (laughs) it going. That shit's wild. That is pretty wild. 82% is kind of kind of low 82. wow i would have guessed higher i would have guessed right along yeah <laughs> i was focused on the ski knees there. yeah <laughs> very aren't we all no <laughs> um, um damn yeah well, that's, 82 I, yeah, I mean it's not detro it's not like it's not it's not offensively low but it's just a little bit it's like strangely low yeah let's read the critics consensus it reads right. as follows employing gritty camera work and evocative sound effects Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a powerful remake that expands upon themes and ideas only lightly explored in the original. So there you go. I think uh, having not been, none of us having been too familiar with the original, it's going to be tough yeah. for us to agree or disagree. But no. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, you know, the 50s that wasn't wasn't a time that was necessarily uh, all about getting that social commentary in there in their monster <laughs> movies. So. I mean, they 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 work them in because it's sci-fi, and that's what you build it out of. But then you also build out of wire and duct tape and 
put it on a screen as quickly as you can. Yeah. So, hell yeah. You know. Well, hell skeeting you, Bob. Word. Love to see All it. Right. I Man, love it. Just, whoa. How long can we keep this going? <laughs> Till we'll episode 500. Week. We got to ride it all the way through. We got to find out what the streak is, and then we'll just keep counting. We got to keep a skeet and eat counter. I think it's been at least, <laughs> I think this is at least the fourth, potentially the I fifth think week so. in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Ever since Caitlin was on, and I think the week maybe even before that. So, yeah. Yeah, no no streaks. No streaks Whoa. happening yeah. here. Um. All right, let's read a couple of negative reviews because those are often a little bit funny. Often. That's very generous. All Sometimes. right, here's a negative review. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> Maybe once, once in a blue moon. <laughs> yeah. Despite a fl- few creepy moments and some fas- fascinating special effects, the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a disappointment. Well, that's very thorough. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> It's just Why disappointing. Just... Damn. Yeah. What are people Someone was watching? For Sometimes, that like, I just <laughs> can't understand. Haters gonna hate. Like, even uh, disappointment. You got nothing from this movie. <laughs> what? Maybe this huh. next one will. I'm sorry. Bob? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe this next one will have a little bit more to it. Although both versions derive from the same Jack Finney novel, the mood of the newer one is closer to the Stepford Wives than it is to Siegel's original. Now that I could see as a source of disappointment if you love the original, Mm. but I wouldn't agree with that, I don't think, not having read it, obviously. But like, give me a little extra Stepford. Well, give me a little something, you know. I I, I wonder what was different. If there's other... uh, other commentary that's happening that yeah. is in it, this commentary's place, then maybe there's something to be disappointed about. But if it's just like, no, I just want a straightforward tale about about flower people coming and taking all taking over, just like the hippies. Um, I don't know that that Keep doesn't your that politics doesn't out of my me. science fiction. Oh yes, yeah. sci <laughs> fi is famously apolitical. Um. <laughs> All right, one more, and then we'll call it a day on this. All the tension and scariness of the original has gone, and is gone, has gone, and in its place is a bit of floppy old cabbage. See the fifties <laughs> version if you can. Damn. What's, All right. I, what does yeah, that mean? <laughs> what does that fucking mean? Ah, uh, I like cabbage personally. So I want no make- tension in this movie. None? One thing I wanted to mention before is do Jeff Goldblum at one point in the movie says he's six foot four and 170 pounds. And I was like, holy shit. He's, uh, he's, he's skinny, but I that's, don't know, man. That doesn't seem I, right. <laughs> that seems super thin. Yeah. <laughs> six four, one seventy. 170. I mean, I know it's yeah. the seventies and he did look particularly it's thin in this, but <laughs> it's, it's the people 70s. just weren't <laughs> eating back then. <laughs> people Dude, just they emaciated were a lot smaller. Themselves. I mean, <laughs> does anyone want but, to switch seats? But All anyways, right. just thought I'd mention that. Yeah, that's it for Rotten Maters, though. Bob, how's that trivia looking? Have we integrated all already? No, there's a good bit more. Let's do it. All right, let's check it out. It's totally time for trivia. All right, boys. Yeah, there is a decent amount of trivia on this one. Um, So this was released in the United States over the Christmas weekend of 1978. Oh, wow. And it grossed nearly 25 million. And if that number is um, adjusted for inflation, uh, present day, it would have grossed $117 million. All right. solid. a lot, I guess, but I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, I don't. I mean... Christmas, a science fiction movie on Christmas weekends. So that's just one million. weekend. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's so it's a just, sneaky Christmas movie. Just the weekend. Whoa. It came out at Christmas time. Precisely. <laughs> if you know the trivia, then the you can watch it during Christmas. Christmas. Movie. No indication in the runtime, but it's there. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> uh, so this, this was uh, definitely successful. Uh, Robert Duvall, who had previously worked with Philip Kaufman on the great Northfield, Minnesota raid from 1972, happened to be in San Francisco at the time of filming and shot his only scene for free. He's the dude that plays the crazy priest swinging at the beginning of the movie, which is like jarring. Swinging? Yeah, he's like on a swing and the camera actually follows. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
for no, a second. Yeah, I forgot about that. That was very strange. I didn't know yeah. that was Robert Duvall, though. I guess I don't recognize him when he's not geriatric, I don't think. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Damn. Uh, the leather half glove that David Kib- Kibner is wearing in this movie, uh, oh, he wore yeah. deliberately uh, for the sole purpose of making the character more distinctive and recognizable. Apparently, Leonard Nimoy got the idea from a friend who wore it to cover a burn on his hand. Hmm. Okay. V for Vendetta yeah. style. All right. Yeah. Uh, during it the... back. <laughs> Do it. The half you won't. leather glove. You won't. <laughs> Uh, Gambit during the style. during the taxi ride, Donald Sutherland and Brooke Adams' nervousness is genuine. Uh, Don Siegel, who was the director of the 1956 version of the film, uh, was was driving the cab and had lost so much of his vision um, that uh, he was driving, and he was also driving through the streets of San Francisco without his glasses on for some reason. I don't know why you'd do that. Um, so they were apparently terrified. That's a that specific seems... place you would never want to do that. Also, yeah, like so unnecessary. <laughs> San Francisco of all places, like the streets there are like at a fucking full forty five degree Spaghetti. angle. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! I thought you were saying like the highways were crazy. Well, I mean that. I mean it's an incredibly busy place yeah, to drive busy, around, yeah. but also like some of those some of the those hills, yeah, streets are sense. extreme in terms of elevation. That would freak me out. It makes me nervous. Yeah. Uh, never been there, but I'll I'll take your word for it. Uh, Harry, the homeless banjo guy uh, in this movie, um, he that wasn't actually him playing the banjo and singing. Apparently, the song was performed by the Grateful Dead frontman Jerry Garcia, and the Jerry. song the song is called "Going Down the Road Feeling Bad," which apparently was a tune the Dead would often play. Oh, hmm. I think that's a Woody Guthrie song. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me to hear, actually. I'm going to have to look it up just to be sure. The Lonesome Road Blues is the AKA. Uh, yeah. Okay, it was originally, first known recording is from Henry Witter, an Appalachian singer. So it's a, it's a, uh, I don't old know what you call it, just an old timey tune. Yeah, standard. Yeah. Guthrie, Bob Dylan, Skeeter Davis, Elizabeth Cotton. My boy Skeeter. And Grateful Dead, yeah. Skeet yeah. Davis. Uh, the, the night after the movie's release, someone put pods like those in the movie all over the streets of Los Angeles. Some folks got freaked oh. out, thought they were real, and called the cops. Nice. That's the best shit in the world. I Hell love yeah. it. That's cool. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. Yeah. Uh, producer so Robert H. Solo mentioned in a book that he wrote about this uh, called called They're Here. Uh, the Brooke Adams, Jeff Goldbroom. Gold Bloom and Leonard Gold Nimoy uh, each got paid twenty five grand for their roles, and your boy D. Sutherland was paid between two hundred and three hundred thousand. Damn, Donald was pulling weight back then, man. Apparently, I didn't realize, but uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, he was he was a sex he, symbol back then. I want to say, like, whoa. <laughs> back then, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> oh, I mean. <laughs> yeah. He's 88 now. All right. Is, <laughs> I guess they never take away your title. <laughs> I was trying to I was trying to stall while I checked if he was dead or not. Um if you want the honest truth. Um some people be into that too, man. I, uh, no kink shame, but also, yeah, kink shame, maybe. It's getting, it's getting so hot in here. It's just <laughs> not down with necrophilia. I'll go ahead and stand out on that limb. Randy. <laughs> Such a prude. <laughs> Who among us? I'm am a, I right? I'm just a real bad guy. Boy, shade. <laughs> bad guy. <laughs> close minded, maybe. Bad, nah. Hey, you know. vanilla. Sure. Need loving Being close minded is my kink. I can't, <laughs> I can't say shit. <laughs> Being a close minded <laughs> picket is my kink. Well, vanilla <laughs> Randy won't even bang a corpse. Unbelievable. <laughs> Damn. Bubble, bubble. All right, Bobo. The the bagpipe uh, version of Amazing Grace that's playing this movie um, also played during the send off of Spock's coffin in Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan oh, from 1982. Shit. Cool, um, I didn't know that. Philip Kaufman and Frank Pearson both used to occasionally frequent a Scots themed bar where the piece would be played, and they vowed to beat each other 
to use the tune first in their films. Well, there you go. I mean, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Scott's theme bar. Let's do it. Fun. Um, uh, Fun. Appear- yeah, this is us <laughs> adding commentary. Oh, that yeah. sounds hmm. fun. Fun. <laughs> uh, this is the last bit I got here. Veronica Cartwright was not told that Sutherland's character had been captured and turned into an oh. alien. So when oh. they filmed, when they filmed the end in front of San Francisco City Hall, Sutherland pointed to her and imitated the pod scream, and Cartwright's reaction of cold fear was authentic. Dude, well. that's awesome <laughs> she's probably just act playing a role I, mean, so. I wonder what she thought he was gonna say going, like what I, I doubt she's terrified yeah. <laughs> i want to see like what her script said though i'd be very curious yeah, to see what, what she was, was supposed to say in her mind mm-hmm. yeah exactly yeah that's That'd interesting cool. that's cool mm. oh what an ending though that ending's great this that's good great. shit good shit iconic some might say uh but that's all the trivia <laughs> i got others might say Let's uh, let's jump into our cooter of the week. All right. Straight chilling. Cooter of the week. Juice. What is a cooter, and why do we hunt them? Well, Bob Cooter is a character type, and a straight chilling. Exclusive. Nice. Wow, that pod worked fast. Justin can't <laughs> put together <laughs> syllables yet. <laughs> Cooter. Cooter's a character type. It's straight chill and exclusive. Cooter has to hit three of these five points to be considered a Cooter, but we want the Cooter with the most points. Five points of cooterdom are sexual deviance, manipulation, smug arrogance, overall looking attire, and overall patheticness. Boys, do we have a Cooter this week? I think this is a little the bit more flowers. obscure. Yeah, I mean, I think the only answer that I have ready to go would be just the invaders, whatever yeah, you want to define them as. Yeah, but I I'm trying to think of any psychiatrist. Human maybe we could it's give like some smug arrogance. Yeah, I yeah. guess you don't know yeah. which version is him and which one yeah. is a pod. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at him, if you're giving him smug arrogance, if you're assuming that he's human when you first meet him, mm-hmm. um, and so is Jeff Goldblum, we know that much. I think both of them suffer from that same thing, the same amount of it, too. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if if one is smug, then the other is definitely smug. I mean, Goldblum is explicitly like, his, his work is terrible. It's terrible, terrible work. Whatever <laughs> he says, like, it's like, I I, love I, it. it's dog shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 Bob, it's not that funny. <laughs> I'm going off, boys. Can't be contained. Take it off. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Sputtering plane is taking off, boys. Bob, are you laughing on Morse code? What? <laughs> I'm sending an SOS. Bob, what is it? What Call is the it, police. Boy? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> someone stuck in someone stuck in the lake huh what, what is it boy oh someone's stuck in the lake i just for some reason can't talk i'm telling i'm trapped <laughs> in the lake <laughs> oh man uh, um, all right what were we talking about uh, cooters. Well, okay uh cooters. <laughs> uh we're hunting here um so yeah okay yeah i guess it's hard for everybody because you never know you're never 100 percent certain in a lot of cases whether somebody's a pot person or not so i'll tell you this yeah appearance wise um uh peter dinklage ass motherfucker has like, a very good like like uh greasy 70s like i don't know like wall street dipshit kind of look to him especially yeah. when he's giving the cold glare of a pod person but we i mean when he's a person i don't remember him like having much in but he seemed fairly normal like yeah unremarkable just likes basketball yeah, he's just a big basketball guy, he was, and he ignores his girlfriend a little. He was so, watching yeah. the game with headphones on, which was I found that to be very strange. I That's thought a, that was like was a did that. Yeah, technology really? flex for the time. Yeah, it was like honestly, I thought it. I thought it was kind of like the same 
thing when I watch um, Christmas Vacation and the Ice Cube blows up their like CD player. Their you bows, know, yeah, whatever. Their bows, yeah. stereo. Yeah, it's I just don't a know, to, Margo. It's just something to like make it seem like somebody's hip for the time. Yeah, that crazy cool. phone too that had the retractable cord on it into the yeah, wall. Yeah, they paid that special so interest silly. to the cord snapping <laughs> back. Do you notice that? I wonder yeah, why. Yeah, like they cut know. to a close up of the of cord snapping. Sna- yeah. very weird. It was weird. Um. Anyway, Action that's not a cooter shot. though. So um, yeah, it's got to be yeah. the pod people. Nobody's gonna trump the pod people. The so manipulation. Force. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Check. But they don't have smug arrogance, do they? Or do they? No, Where I they would say, say like, like placid. Well, I mean, yeah. yes and no. Think about it. Like, I think that At World's End really does expound on this deal really well. At the end of that movie, there's like they te- talk to Bill Nighy as the, yeah. as the invading force leader or whatever, and he's like, "We're here to set thing, make things simpler for you. Everybody mm-hmm. will get everything they need." And and they're like, "No, we want to live. Our, we want to be individuals." Is basically the yeah. thing. And so like. If they do, if they have that thing like we know better than you what you not want, then yeah, I mm-hmm. think you can give them smugness. Yeah. They definitely do. Yeah, I mean they're but they're they like, may. You... It's also. I'm sorry. Go ahead. They're they're like yeah you have you have, you're no longer gonna have a, a need to love or hate like you're everything's gonna be better like you know so yeah, yeah. I would but say you some, could chalk that up to more manipulation as a to, pattern yeah, of biology yeah. because this movie yeah. positions them as a biological force not an ideological force mm. That's yeah true. like a, a true parasite just taking yeah. over yeah there's no um sexual deviance in this film I don't not that I can remember. <laughs> Um, no, I don't think so. Looking at tire for the even for the seventies, everyone's looking okay. Nobody was looking yeah. super I strange. Love Sutherland's trench coat is uh, it's nice. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a clean coat. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe cooter free. Maybe cooter mm. free here. I can't clock. I, feel like I mean, if you if you want to give them a tire for the dog with a human face. You know, that's kind of fucked up. <laughs> I, I'm okay with it. I can I can live with the mutations. The thing is like I see it as an amoral fo- an amoral force in the term in in terms of like mm. not having a morality. I don't think it has a morality. I think it's yeah. Yeah. like the it thing. Just, like it's yeah. A, it consumes just it consumes functions, worlds. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, well, all so, right. I don't know. Nature's a son of a bitch. There Nature is a son of a bitch. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cooter free. Who would have thought? Who'd have thunk? Not me. Cool. Um, we're gonna skip over what we've been watching this week because your boy has a hard out tonight. But we the do have out. it's really hard. We do have a voicemail though. So let's get into our hotline screams. Hotline screams. If you guys are listening and would like to call and leave a voicemail to be featured on next week's show, you can hit us up at 904-638-3231. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from our boy, JT. Let's hear what he's got to say. What up, straight chilling crew? It's your boy, JT, representing the fucking Dayton, Ohio chapter of the straight chilling crew. Um don't necessarily have anything specific to talk about just wanted to come on here and show my love been a long time fan of the show it's fucking been my favorite podcast for like hell six years now i listen to you guys like practically on a daily basis at work and i just appreciate y'all being such a big part of my life and uh yeah um i guess i don't really have any make i don't have any really summer plans i do and, well, I guess it's technically happening right before fall. I go to um, there's a convention called Horror Hound that I go to every year. It's happening in September, like a few days before fall. So I guess you can consider that summer plans. Um, other than that, I'm just going to be uh, chilling, hanging out. Um, but, yeah, you guys uh, keep chilling. And sorry for sounding like an awkward piece of shit because that is who I am as a person. Uh, yeah, keep chilling, y'all. Hey now, and I won't accept the idea that the proud city of Dayton would produce such a piece of shit. The <laughs> birthplace of a uh, uh, of the Wright brothers, if I recall. So, or at least their bike shops there. 
you know <laughs> thanks no, very dude. kind very kind yeah man words, thanks for our support yeah. and listening mm-hmm. and welcome to the slack i haven't been on there as much as i usually am but yeah i saw you on there my guy so welcome yeah yeah d- yeah thanks for the kind words and for for being hard with us for six plus years or whatever that's yeah damn super badass yeah love mm-hmm. to hear it um I've I've never uh been to Ohio, uh, but I've heard of the the monster or whorehound whorehound weekend. I think is what he what I've he said. I've heard of it too. Yeah. Um, it sounds like a good time. I, I it seems like one of the bigger horror conventions in the country, at least as far as I can tell. Anyways, so I mean, it seems worth checking out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love it. Let's. There's, so, there's just too much to go. do, man. Field trip. Yeah. There's too much to do summer plans wise. Like we already got plenty of summer plans in the form of just like, yeah, multiple yeah, we festivals we got to cover. Uh, lot, we don't want to spoil work. it, but holy shit! Oh my lord, yeah. here we go, boys. Yeah, I did Fun hear uh, JT said we could just crash at his house though, so I'll, I'll see y'all there oh, in September. Sweet. All right? oh, I didn't hear that at all, but I appreciate yeah, he you said that. Close oh, towards, yeah. oh, towards the end. Oh, oh. I know you. Letters. I don't think this train's slowing down until after Christmas, so strap in. It's never. It's it's a bullet train, boys. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's a bullet, a pr- bullet plane. Tra- bullet train. Bullet plane. It's a bullet train that starts at birth and ends in the casket. Is what I was trying to get out. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. It's you can't kill me, boys. You, you can only make me dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's my philosophy, you know. Yeah. That's how I live my life. I stand by that. Cool. Yeah. Thanks again for calling in JT, man. And it's awesome having you on the Slack and, uh, you know, uh, taking a larger role in our little community and uh, yeah, consider this a, another, uh, uh, commercial for the Slack. If you guys are listening and would like to join in, uh, a great group of, of folks on there that listen to the show and are into horror and, um, are super kind and thoughtful people. So if you want to join and just hit us up on one of our social media outlets and I'll send you a link and you can join in too. And there's like a seventy-eight uh, percent chance that if you join the Slack, you will have a podcast by the end of the year of your own. Oh, so yeah. yeah. It's the pipeline. <laughs> yeah. Join the odds the are pipeline. good. The odds are very good. <laughs> uh that's that's it. Uh this week. Do you do you guys have any prompts you want to throw out for next week? Hmm. Good question. Maybe what do you want for Christmas? No. Right? What? Come on. Because we're I, celebrating. I we're talking about Moth Mang next week. Yeah. Yeah. Christmas in is there, June. Here's my question then. I, I mean, it being a cryptid episode, what cryptids are local to you and what and or what cryptids do you actually think might exist? If you actually think that Bigfoot's out there, I want to hear from you. Mm. If you actually think that Mothman is a thing or, you know, the the skunk ape or the Wendigo or the Ozark Howler or whatever, let mm. us know. And if not, just tell us you know, your local fave. I believe in the the Winnebago out there, you know, creeping. Oh, Winnebago man out there cursing <laughs> up a storm. <laughs> Watch your profanity. Yeah, next week we're talking about the Mothman Call in prophecies. Henry. Uh from uh from 2002 which was the winner of the June poll. I remember years ago and I can't remember who it was, but I was talking to somebody about the Mothman prophecies and they full on believed the Mothman was real and like had a fucked up story about it. Um, I can't remember who it was. If you're listening, call in. Tell us your Mothman story. Um, it's a pretty high, high, high threshold for me to buy any of it, but I love hearing people talk about it. Me too. It. Yeah. <laughs> me too, man. Yeah, you cryptid know? stories it's next just... week. Like nothing I'd ever smelled before in my life. Uh, 904-638-3231. <laughs> Hit us up. And uh, check out the Mothman. Get ready for next week's show. I don't. I can't remember if it's streaming anywhere. I know it's on Blu-ray. You could probably rent it digitally. I, I think it's pretty easy to find, pretty accessible. Uh, so check it out. Yeah. Till next week. As always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling.